just want to read you a passage this morning from Psalms 121, verses 1 to 2. And it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your feet to be moved. Come on, do you need help from our Creator this morning? I don't know what your life has been like this week, but God knows. I don't know what your situation is or what help you need or what miracle you need, but I know that you can look to your Heavenly Father this morning and you can ask for His help this morning. Yeah. That whatever storm, whatever season that you may face, whether today, tomorrow, our God never changes, amen? Yeah. So come on, let's worship Him this morning. Do you have a need in your life this morning that you need God to intervene? If you do, just lift up your hand to Him this morning. Many needs across the building this morning. Come on, let's just ask God to do something in those circumstances this morning. Come on, do we believe that God is still the same God who heals the brokenhearted, who makes the blind see? Come on, He's the same God as the God we read about in the Word. His promises are still true. His miracles are still possible. God, we just pray over those that lifted their hands in the house this morning that need an intervention from you, Lord. We know that you're the God of miracles. You're the God of provision. You're the God of comfort this morning. And we just pray your hand upon your people this morning. And we just pray that those that need to look to you this morning will lift their eyes and look for help from you this morning, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your gracious, graciousness and your mercy this morning. And we just pray that our praises are enough for you today.
So let's read from Jeremiah chapter 20. Please excuse my voice this morning. It was worn out before it got here. It's even more wore out for singing, but I know it will come back as we continue to preach the word of God as it usually does this morning. Jeremiah chapter 20. When the chief priest Pashur, son of Emer, the official in charge of the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. And then we'll jump to verse seven. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all the day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, the word in my heart is like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him, let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip saying, Perhaps he will be deceived. Then he will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and thoroughly be disgraced. Their honor and dishonor will never, sorry, they will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. And we know God will bless his word. I'd like to speak for a while this morning. And if we don't get it finished this morning, we'll carry it on in the next week. Um, on the theme of defeating discouragement. Defeating discouragement. Anybody ever get discouraged? Hmm? Anybody ever get discouraged? Yeah, I guess it's part of life. Discouragement comes most often when you do the right things but don't get the right results. You work hard but you don't make progress. You practice and try giving it your all but you don't perform well. You spend time with your kids going out of your way to be a good parent but they still rebel against you. Discouragement eats at us. No matter what form it takes or how it comes, when you get discouraged, it messes with you. It wants us to quit or say and do things we normally wouldn't do or say. We get frustrated with others and ourselves. Sometimes we even get frustrated and angry with God. I have to confess that this little study this morning came out of my own discouragement. Uh, and you might think, well, you can never get discouraged. Well, I'm just human like you are. And Susan and I often at times sit and think, you know, talk about things that maybe are discouraging us that wee bit, but you get over it quickly and you press on, and maybe it's a pressing problem with the church, or maybe it's some other issue in life that everybody has to face from time to time, and you get those little moments, your bad days, as I would call them, when you have to shake yourself, you know, but you always get over it. But I have to confess, this little message was birthed out of a few weeks when I was wrestling with discouragement, and I'll tell you why. I never thought it'd be like this. Um, but Susan and I have talked about this often too. Discouragement from getting old. From getting old. Now, I'm a senior citizen now officially. Closer to 70 than I ever was to 60. Um, but the number itself doesn't bother me. It's what age is doing to me bothers me and frustrates me. You know, I used to be able to run, work 16 hours a day and get by on four hours sleep. It's the other way around. Now you work for four hours and you want to sleep for 16 hours. <laughs> you get out of the morning and instead of jumping out of bed and running to the kitchen to get your Weetabix, you roll your legs out and decide which one's sorest and which one will it put down first. And it frustrates me because anybody who's known me for a long time knows I can't sit still for five minutes but I'm frustrated because my body won't let me do what I want to do anymore. Even my hands, I got up in the morning and I actually have to detune the top two strings on the guitar because these two fingers here don't want to bend anymore. They want to try and stay straight. So they actually push the strings slightly sharp on the guitar. So I have to purposely detune them to stay in tune. And the other hand, that's worse. I got up in the morning and there's the way it is. And I have to literally start straightening this finger out. 
and work with it for about 10 minutes before it actually will do anything. And it frustrates me no end, the physical failing away. And frustration can lead to discouragement because you can't do the things that you want to do. Worse still, the mind. Ooh. Somebody would say to me, John's always asking me questions. I love John. I've still a couple to answer for him. But it's taken me longer, John, because the mind's not sharp like it used to be. I've lost my edge in here. I know it. Nobody needs to tell me. But it frustrates me. John asked me a question, and normally I would be able to respond, listen, brother, if you go to James chapter 1, or if you go to 1 Corinthians 3, and, and here's what Paul says, but now it's a case of, listen, brother, here's what Paul, and was it Paul or was it John? You have to think about it. I came home from music practice the other week and I was so frustrated because Lois had decided to change the keys in one of the songs that we normally do and change it to a different key. Now, even a year ago, I could have said, we're changing from C to F. It's up four tones. It becomes a B flat instead of a B natural. And the minor becomes a D minor. Done it off the top of my head. You see, now I've got to look at the music and sometimes even then I still struggle to work it out quick enough because the mind has lost its sharpness. And nobody needs to tell me that. I know it. I have to tell you this one, and then I'll get into the study, but I'm telling you this for a reason. Then in the kitchen the other day, put my pod in the coffee machine, clicked it on, set it the right set, and pushed it. Walked away, talking to my grandson, who happened to be there at the time, hadn't put the cup under the coffee machine. I ended up having to take my coffee off the worktop. <laughs> but it frustrates me no end. I'm discouraged not because of anybody else or anything else, because I've got a wonderful wife, a beautiful bunch of kids and grandkids, have the greatest church family on the planet, God's blessing my life, but I'm discouraged for a few weeks because I'm getting old and it's starting to tell and frustrate me. Don't mock because it's coming your way soon. <laughs> but here's the thing which is why I'm preaching this sermon this morning. You see, when discouragement sets in, then the enemy really starts to get at you. When he sees discouragement, then he starts to do his work. And I started to hear the little voice in here. Ah, silly old fool, what are you doing? Up there playing guitar with all them young people. Look at you, you're a pensioner. Sometimes you can't even play the right chords. Time to quit, son. Stand in that pulpit preaching to that church. Listen, you're starting to forget even the text sometimes. You're starting to you have to think about it. Do you really think you're blessing them? Do you really think they're getting anything out of it? And the little voice starts to whisper, and then eventually it gets to the real message. It's time to retire. It's time to stop. It's time to quit. Now, I have good news for you. Well, I hope it's good news. I don't intend to retire or quit just yet. Now, there will be a time in the near future when that will come because you, ultimately you have to retire because your body and mind just doesn't cope anymore and you start to hold things back instead of help push them forward. But I'm not ready just yet. But this little message was birthed and I hope it helps you this morning to deal with those moments of discouragement just as it helped me because I preached this to myself and now I'm going to preach it to you. You see, that's how Jeremiah felt. God had called them to speak a harsh message to a rebellious people. Now, he obeyed God, and what did he get for it? Beaten and thrown in prison, in the stocks. He endured physical, emotional, spiritual, and professional anguish, all because he was doing God's will. He became discouraged and sorry for himself. Like me, a couple of nights ago, he started to have a pity party for himself. He was discouraged. In the last of his recorded laments, and that's what he was doing, lamenting. We find the highs and lows of human emotions. He goes through grief and joy, despair, delight, perplexity, and praise. Like Jesus, Jeremiah reminds us that even a faithful servant of God can get discouraged. However, Jeremiah lived above that, rose above the discouragement, and fulfilled God's will. How did he do it? Well, the scriptures and his story leaves us a few pointers. Would you like to hear them this morning? So here's how to defeat discouragement. Here's the first one. Tell God about it. Tell God about it. Jeremiah wasn't afraid to tell God how he felt. 
You know, sometimes we think it's wrong to go to God and complain. If that's how you feel, well then, go and complain. God understands. If you're happy and joyful, well, tell him so. But if you feel miserable, well, tell him so. Jeremiah wasn't afraid to go and tell God exactly how he felt. He felt deceived by God. God had given him a job to do, which he knew was the will of God, and yet he ends up getting beaten and thrown in prison and abused because of it. He felt deceived by God. Now look, obviously God does not mislead or, mis or trick people, but Jeremiah felt God had lured him into the ministry and then made a laughing stock out of him. He felt ridiculed and offended. His voice was not making a difference. He was doing what God was telling him and nothing was working. And now there he was alone and beaten and in prison. Look, if that's how we begin to feel about things, go and tell God about it. Whatever it is, go and tell God about it. God wants us to talk to him, even when we're angry, even when we're upset, even when we get frustrated. He wants us to tell him that we're frustrated or fed up. Now, he already knows that, but he wants us to come and ask for his help. Hmm? People ask me sometimes, is it wrong to get angry with God? Well, first of all, we have to remember that God gave us that emotion. Anger is an emotion. It's part of who we are. Now, sometimes we don't use it correctly, but we have it nevertheless. We must remember that. Emotions are neither right nor wrong in that sense. How we use them can be. People are sometimes surprised when I give them the answer. If you feel angry towards God, tell them. God's big enough, tough enough, and strong enough to handle any hurt or anger you've got. So tell him. He wants to know about it. Remember when Jesus poured out his heart to the Father in Gethsemane before going to the cross? We need to do the same. Go and talk to God about it. Tell him exactly what's on your mind, on your heart, good or bad. God wants to know. And by pouring out these emotions, we can embrace what God wants to do for us in our time of discouragement. God doesn't want us stuck in anger or frustration or negativity or the other feelings that we might have. God wants us to go and talk to him, leave them with him, and let God push us forward and encourage us in the Lord. God wants us to be real people, forthright with him, who go to him, bringing their motivations and their emotions to him. Truth is, God already knows what our hearts are thinking, our thoughts, our motives, our intents, our emotions, even before we speak them. But God wants us, like a father wants his children, to go and tell him about it. That's what God wants. Feeling discouraged? Go and tell God about it. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. Here's the second one. Still do what you're called to do. Still do what you're called to do. Look, in spite of the evil pastures, unjustified actions by putting Jeremiah in prison, beating him and leaving him in the stocks, Jeremiah was almost ready to let go of God's purpose, but ultimately we're told in our reading that he couldn't do it. Jeremiah would not be at peace doing anything else but what God had called him to do. God's message burned, he said, like a fire on his bones that he couldn't put out. He couldn't be quiet about it. He couldn't stop preaching the message that God had told him. Jeremiah did not preach because he had to say something, but because he had something to say. Not saying it would have destroyed him and taken him out of the will of God. Still do what you're called to do. It doesn't matter how discouraged you feel. Still keep doing what God's told you to do, whatever that is. Keep on doing it. Don't stop even if you don't feel like doing it, even if you feel it's not getting any results, even if you feel people are making fun of you for it, even if you feel that it's a situation that seems to be no win, just keep on doing it and watch what God will do for you. Do you know that most pastors keep doing what they're doing in spite of rejection or anger or lack of results? Plain and simply, why? Because the call of God keeps them going. You know, over the years, I've often spent time with other ministers bemoaning the struggles of our vacation as pastors and leaders. And despite our struggles, we all, I guess, come to the same conclusion. 
And if someone comes to us asking if they should go into the ministry, I have to be honest, I would tell them, if you can find something else to do that you really, 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 really want and need to do, do it instead of the ministry. But we also all agreed in our conversations, you know what? Why do we not go and do something else? Because we're called to do this and we can't do anything else. We've got to fulfill the call of God. We've got to keep on doing what we're doing. I'm an old rocker at heart. My favorite band, and they're still for me the greatest band in the world, is the Rolling Stones. Okay, sometimes they don't play in tune. A lot of times they don't even keep good time in their music, but they're still the best rock and roll band out there. And I saw a little interview a few weeks ago with Keith Richards, and there he sat throughout the whole interview with a guitar in his lap. And every few minutes, he literally forgot the interviewer was there, and he just started to play and pick and hum wee tunes. And the interviewer had to keep interjecting. And he asked him finally this question. He said, Keith, after all these years, the guy's in his late 70s, possibly even 80, all these years, why do you still do it? What keeps you going? And old Keith looked at him, still plucking his guitar, and he said, it's who I am and it's what I do. Simple as that. It's who I am and what I do. That rang a chord with me. Whatever God has called you to do or be, that's who you are and that's what you have to do. And even in moments of discouragement, even when it feels like it's not working, even if it seems like everything else is falling apart, just keep doing it until God tells you to stop. If you don't, it'll eat you up. I can't wait to get to church. Sometimes it doesn't go to plan. Sometimes everything doesn't work the way you want. Sometimes some of you might get on my nerves. and I'm thinking, That could never happen, could it? No. But I still show up. Why? Because there's nothing else satisfies like being in the presence of God and doing what God's told you to do. That call from God starts in your heart as the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And it manifests itself in reaching out and doing something that God's told you to do, no matter how big it is or how small it is. The time the inward call of God comes and it's reflected outward in doing something in the kingdom of God. Keep on doing it. Warren Wearsby, pastor and author, writes this. He says, the work of the ministry is too demanding and difficult for a man to enter it without a sense of divine calling. Men enter and then leave the ministry usually because they lack a sense of divine urgency. Nothing less than a definite call from God could ever give a man success in his ministry. The point is this. What's he saying? If you're doing something for God, if you're already fulfilling a purpose for God, whatever it might be, keep doing it. If it's something you're doing to gratify you or just done out of a sense of obligation, then go and rethink about it. But if it's done because it's the purpose of God and you're being obedient to God, then just keep on doing it no matter what. God will ultimately prove it and bless it. Sometimes obedience is difficult and painful. And yet, you know what? Disobedience is even more so. Keep on doing what you're doing. Number three, and we're going to get through these this morning at last. We're going to get through the lot. Here's the third thing Jeremiah learned. Understand, God is always with you. You might be discouraged, you might be feeling down, but God's still there. Jeremiah had the realization that he wasn't alone. Listen what he says in verse 11. But the Lord is with me like a violent warrior. What? God's there to fight in your behalf. God's there to take on the enemy, the, the, the depression, the discouragement, whatever it might be. Jeremiah was not on the losing side, and neither are you. He wins, and you will win because God walks with you. Look, often in our discouragement, we look inward to our problems, our frustrations, our situations, instead of looking outward and upward to the Lord who knows and understands. God accompanies us. He's a present tense God. He's a real-time God. He's an in-the-moment God, and he's here this morning to take care of me and to take care of you. Can you imagine the difference it would make in our lives if we could get this into our mindset permanently that God's always right here with me and right there with you? What a difference it would make. 
Every time you go into a stressful situation, God will be there. Every time you go in to do that job interview that you really don't think you're going to get, God will be there. Every time you've got to deal with a situation in life that's difficult, God will be there. God is always with you. And even when you feel discouraged, God's still with you. Knowledge of God's presence will help us accomplish significant things despite our discouragement. The presence of God provides us with valor, with guts, with strength, with tenacity, and perseverance. The great A.W. Tozer writes these words, living in the glow of God's presence will enable you to fight on despite your discouragement. Brilliant. Brilliant. Number four. And lastly, how to defeat discouragement? Keep praising God. Just keep praising God. Jeremiah's discouragement eventually turned to joy. His defeated attitude turned to triumph. His dismay turned to courage. And the key that unlocked the door to victory was praise. Here's what he declares triumphantly in verse 13 of that chapter. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise is, now watch this church, praise is the one weapon in the Christian's arsenal against which Satan has absolutely no defense. I'll say that again. It's the one weapon in our arsenal that Satan has no defense against. When we praise God, we are acknowledging that God is in charge, that he can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, in whatever situation he wants to do it. So let's just keep on praising God. Praise is more than just acknowledging God for the good that comes our way. Praise is accepting from God everything that comes our way and still worshiping Him and still giving Him the glory. The praise we offer when things don't go our way is actually more precious to God than the praise we offer when things are good. What does praise do for us? Let me mention four things, four paragraphs very quickly. Praise recognizes our provider. Praise takes our minds off the situation and focuses them on God, our provider. It gives God the right to rule and reign in our lives, how he sees fit. When we praise God, it acknowledges that God knows more about what he's doing than we do, and he even knows more about us than we do. Praise accepts the fact that God can take all the bad stuff of life and still make something great out of it. And how many of us haven't proved that? Come on, haven't you proved that in the past? Praise recognizes we have a provider. Praising God also does something else. It acknowledges God's plan. If you read a few chapters later in Jeremiah, it records these words. For I, yeah, you know this scripture well, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, not for your disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now that's God talking there, folks. That's not just some prophet or some teacher. That's God talking. I have a plan for your welfare, not for disaster, but to give you a future and a hope. We don't see the finished product, but God already knows the end from the beginning. And when we realize God has a plan, we have two options. We can fight it or we can embrace it. And even if that means going through discouragement, well then, that's okay. Praise recognizes the provider. Praise acknowledges God's plan. Praise thirdly accepts the present Praise is based on total and joyful acceptance of where you are now in the plan and will and purpose of God. And I don't want you to, to answer me openly, but maybe this has been the best week of your life you've just come through. Well, hallelujah. I'll rejoice with you. Praise God. Maybe it's the worst week you've ever had and you never want to have another one like it. Doesn't matter. God's still worthy of praise. Keep on praising him. Why? Because it accepts that you are in the will of God. Praise is not based on what we think or hope will happen in the future. Praise is based on the fact that God's in control and that he's working it out if we're willing to follow him. We praise God not for what we expect will happen around us, but praise him for who he is, where he is, and the fact that we're with him right now. Keep on praising. Fourthly and lastly, we praise. Praise releases the power of God. Prayer opens the door for God's power to move into our lives. But it is the prayer of praise that releases even more of God's power than any other form of petition. The psalmist wrote these words, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. 
or the praises of God's people. God actually dwells, inhabits, and resides in our praise. Do you want to know God's presence continually with you? Well, then just keep praising him all day long, and he's there. God's power and presence is always with us when we praise him. When we praise God for the present situation as part of God's plan, God's power is unleashed. When we praise God for the unknown circumstances of the future, we're putting them into God's hand and saying, God, we're trusting you. Singers, musicians, you can come. Yes, you can defeat discouragement. Yes, you can get to the point where you can find joy in your heart again and lose that feeling of discouragement. How do we do it? Tell God how you feel. Secondly, just keep doing what you're called to do. Thirdly, just understand that God is with you. And fourthly, in light of all that, just keep praising God. Just keep praising God. Come on, will you stand with me, church? And let's do that this morning. Let's end this service with a resounding note of praise an adoration for a great God, a great King, a great Father who loves us. Let's go out and hope this morning. He is a champion who fights on your behalf and mine, regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances of life. God is a champion who fights on your behalf and mine.
it with peace, confidence, and belief. And Pastor Jim taught us this morning that the first thing that we can do to enter into the presence of the Lord and the best weapon we have is to lift our voice in praise this morning. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't lifted your voice this morning, it doesn't matter if you don't know the melody line, it doesn't matter if you don't know the words, God just wants to hear your song to Him this morning. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're the person who's striving this morning and you, you're constantly striving to kind of make it okay that you, you can have a relationship with God despite your failures, despite your circumstances, stop the striving, let it cease. God is your victory. 